before we actually get into the discussion of the individual drugs, I want to sort of set the scene for this video. The first thing that I want to say is that the majority of the high yield content related to these questions is understanding the mechanism of these drugs. For the most part, anytime you change dopamine or any other neurotransmitter, the effects of doing that are somewhat predictable. And for that reason, these drugs don't really test side effects as much as they test mechanisms. The other reason that the mechanism is so important and so high yield is because on exams on USMLE and Comlex, you've got all these different drugs that can all be used to treat Parkinson's disease. And therefore, the test writer thinks that it's exciting that he, can, he or she can ask you, what's the mechanism of this one? What's the mechanism of this one? Because just as a general theme, anytime you've got a, a bunch of drugs that do the same thing, the test writers will go after the differences between those drugs. And in this case, the major difference is obviously going to be the mechanism. So with that said, we're going to pay really close attention to mechanisms and give less attention to the other details about these medications. But I'll, I'll point out what's important and what's high yield for you to know as we go. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology, very briefly, of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease can be thought of as either being a decrease of dopamine or an increase of acetylcholine. And I know what you're thinking. You're sitting there and you're going, oh my God, dirty. It has nothing to do with acetylcholine. It's all dopamine. And, and yeah, technically you would be correct. But for the purposes of understanding how these drug works, drugs work, I want you to think about Parkinson's disease as a decreased amount of dopamine or an increased amount of acetylcholine. Now, specifically, when we say that there's a decreased amount of dopamine, what we're talking about are the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra of the brain. So decreased levels of dopamine specific to the substantia nigra. Now, because the, the pathophysiology of Parkinson's, as I'm telling you, is decreased dopamine or increased acetylcholine, it should make sense to you that the drugs are either going to increase dopamine and therefore mitigate the decreased dopamine in the substantia nigra, or these drugs are going to be anticholinergic, which is to say that they'll decrease acetylcholine because the other possibility is that there's too much acetylcholine. The real truth here is that there's a ratio that exists between dopamine and acetylcholine, and it's an inverse relationship. So the less dopamine you have, the more acetylcholine you have, and vice versa. Therefore, one of the proposed mechanisms that could treat Parkinson's disease is decreasing the acetylcholine excess and therefore indirectly increasing dopamine. So the takeaway from this slide, and before we get into this lecture, you, you need to understand this. The takeaway is that Parkinson's disease is decreased dopamine and increased acetylcholine. And because of that, we're gonna use these drugs to increase dopamine or to decrease acetylcholine. So now I wanna get into the actual discussion of the different Parkinson's drugs. And again, this is going to pay very close attention to mechanisms. So. Here we go, we've got L-DOPA, which is a dopamine precursor that exists in the periphery. And in order for L-DOPA to be converted into dopamine in the brain, it has to pass the blood-brain barrier. And once it passes the blood-brain barrier, L-DOPA can be turned into dopamine. Now, there's also the chance that instead of being turned into central dopamine, once it passes through the blood-brain barrier, that the L-DOPA will instead stay in the periphery. And in the periphery, L-DOPA can also be changed into peripheral dopamine. And the enzyme that catalyzes that conversion is dopa d carboxylase. Now, what's important for you to know from this slide? Well, in order to treat Parkinson's disease, the goal is to increase levels of dopamine. Centrally, I'm talking. So you want more dopamine in the brain, more dopamine available for the dopaminergic system in the substantia nigra. So, if peripherally the L-DOPA is being changed into dopamine, as you see on this slide, then less L-DOPA is available to cross the blood-brain barrier and less L-DOPA can be converted into dopamine for use in the substantia nigra. So the first Parkinson's drug that we will talk about works by inhibiting peripheral dopa decarboxylase. And again, the goal here is to increase the precursor L-DOPA because you're preventing it from peripherally being shunted to dopamine. 
And because the L-DOPA would then be increased, that L-DOPA can pass through the blood-brain barrier and convert itself into dopamine within the brain. So carbidopa is our first Parkinson's drug, and it's going to be a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor, as shown on this slide. Now going back to our pathway, you've now got dopamine in the brain. So look at the brain part of this drawing. Dopamine can be converted into one of two things. One is called DOPAC and the other is 3MT. For the purposes of USMLE and Comlex, you do not need to know what DOPAC and 3MT stand for. You really don't even know that, don't even really need to know that they exist per se. But what you do need to know is the enzymes that catalyze these conversions. So dopamine going to DOPAC, that's done by monoamine oxidase B. And dopamine going to 3MT is catalyzed by the enzyme COMT, or COMT. Now there are several more Parkinson's drugs that act on this part of the pathway, and they're shown here. So selegiline and resagiline are both monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. So they inhibit the enzyme that converts dopamine to dopac. And the medication entacapone is an inhibitor of COMT, or COMT, so that drug is going to prevent the conversion of dopamine to 3-MT. And just like we saw in our previous discussion about carbidopa, the goal here is to prevent the breakdown of dopamine. And therefore, you would be increasing the levels of dopamine in the brain and therefore treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So on this slide so far, you see four different drugs that act by inhibiting three different enzymes. And as I said at the start of this video, it's really important to understand the mechanistic differences between all of these drugs because they all do the same thing, but they all act differently. Now let's look at the cellular level. Let's look at some really in-depth neurophysiology to understand what some other drugs can do to treat Parkinson's disease. So what I'm showing you here is a synapse between two neurons. And on the postsynaptic area, you've got dopaminergic receptors, and I've written that in on the slide as DA receptors. So those are dopamine receptors shown as the black rectangles. And under normal circumstances, of course, the dopamine would bind to these receptors and they would carry out neuronal function. You've got a class of drugs which are known as dopamine agonists, and those drugs include bromocryptine, pramipexol, and ropinirol. And all of these drugs act as dopamine agonists to basically increase the levels of dopamine in the synaptic cleft, and those drugs would bind to the postsynaptic dopamine receptors and stimulate the postsynaptic dopamine receptor. So for the case of Parkinson's disease, you would be giving somebody one of these three drugs, hoping that it would bind to the postsynaptic dopamine receptors, and therefore functionally increasing the levels of dopamine in the brain, specifically the substantia nigra. So those three drugs are dopamine agonists. There's another class of drug that we're gonna talk about now, but before we mention what that drug is specifically, let's talk a little bit more about the pathophysiology here. So you've got dopamine reuptake channels, and just as a theme of neurology and neuroscience, you should understand that in any synaptic cleft, any neurotransmitter goes back into the presynaptic neuron through a reuptake channel. And in this case, since we're obviously talking about dopamine, the way that this works is you've got free-floating dopamine still existing in the synaptic cleft between these two neurons, and under normal physiologic circumstances, that dopamine would go back up through the dopamine reuptake channel. And in doing so, it would decrease the amount of dopamine available to stimulate the postsynaptic neuron. So the next drug that we're going to talk about, which is amantadine, blocks dopamine reuptake. And instead of dopamine going back into the presynaptic neuron, there's therefore more dopamine available to sit in the synapse and continually stimulate the postsynaptic receptor. So functionally, when you give somebody amantadine, by inhibiting that dopamine reuptake channel, you're increasing the levels of dopamine. And that's how this treats Parkinson's disease. So on this slide right now, these are all the main Parkinson's drugs. All of their mechanisms are illustrated for you. But the question that you probably have is, how do I remember this, right? The dreaded question in all of medicine when you're studying for USMLE and Comlex is how do I memorize this minutia?
Well, here's a summary of everything that we've talked about so far, and I'm gonna give you some really cool mnemonics to help you memorize these different mechanisms. But just to quickly summarize before we go through those mnemonics, entacapone is a COMT inhibitor. Both selegiline and risagiline are MAOB inhibitors, or monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. Carbidopa is a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. Amantadine inhibits dopamine reuptake. And all of bromocryptine, ropinerol, and pramopexol are dopamine receptor agonists. Let's go through these one at a time and throw out some sick mnemonics. So first we've got entacapone. And entacapone to me sounds like Al Capone, the famous gangster. The way that I remember this is that Al Capone commits crimes. And if you look at the word commit, it's got COMT in it. So entacapone is a COMT inhibitor. So this one's super easy. Entacapone sounds like Al Capone, the famous gangster. Entacapone or Al Capone commits crimes. Commits reminds me of Compt. So Entacapone is a Compt inhibitor. Boom, bang, done, easy, free points. Let's move on. Selegiline and Risagiline. So Selegiline and Risagiline, as you'll notice, both end in line or lean, right? L-I-N-E, line. And MAOB inhibitors, some people actually, when they say monoamine oxidase B, they, they say the shorthand. So they say MO inhibitors or MOB inhibitors. So MO. So selegiline and risagiline both have line in the name and they are MO inhibitors, specifically MOB inhibitors. And the easy way to remember this is that you want really sweet lines when you mow the lawn. So selegiline, risagiline, they, they both end in line. When you're mowing the lawn, you want your lines. You want those sweet lines that they put on like, you know, football stadiums, soccer stadiums, etc. So you want lines when you mow the lawn. So anything that ends in line is a mow inhibitor or specifically a mow B inhibitor. Easy guys, I'm telling you, you're gonna crush this on testing. You're gonna get these free points because you're, you're memorizing my really stupid mnemonics here. And yes, they're stupid, but they work. Um, carbidopa, you don't need a mnemonic because look at the drug. It ends in dopa. So carbi dopa is a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. I'm not going to give you anything else. Like sometimes less is more, my friends. Um, amantadine. So we've got amantadine. And look at the end of amantadine. It has the word dine in it. And remember that amantadine is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So you dine at a drive through right? You dine, amantadine, at a drive through D-R-I, drive through the DRI stands for dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So dine at a drive through for amantadine. So again, stupid mnemonics, yes. Free points, absolutely, okay? Um, for bromocryptine, ropinerol, and pramipexol, I don't have a mnemonic. You just kind of have to memorize it, but because these drugs tend, they, they feel like they show up all the time in practice questions and stuff, I, I would go out on a limb and say that most medical students probably do recognize at least bromocryptine as a dopamine receptor agonist. So I'm not gonna throw out a mnemonic for that. Now remember, at the start of this lecture, I told you there were two ways that we could treat Parkinson's disease. One was by increasing dopamine, because the problem is decreased dopamine. And the other was by decreasing acetylcholine, because there's a relative excess of acetylcholine. So it should make sense to you that the last two drugs that we'll talk about today are anticholinergics, which means they decrease acetylcholine. There's not much that you need to know, but the two drugs are benztropine and trihexphenidyl. These are both anticholinergics, so as you might expect, all of the adverse drug reactions that you could be tested on are gonna be all that anticholinergic stuff that you've already memorized. But the takeaway and the summary of what you need to know in order to do well for Parkinson's drugs is everything that you see on this slide. If you need to rewatch this video, please do so because for whatever reason, Parkinson's drugs are extremely high yield. There's a ton that they can ask you about. There's a ton that they can connect this to and give you what appears to be a drug question, but then you know do a 180 and throw some curveball at you to get you to answer a question about Parkinson's, about neurology, about neurotransmitters, about pharmacology, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it. Hit some likes, throw me some comments, please check out my Patreon page. And if you like the content that I'm putting out, support the channel. I wish you all well. Hope everybody is staying safe during this difficult time.